Yeah. Well, welcome to another episode of the Scriptural Mormonism podcast. I'm your host, Robert Baldwin, and today we actually have a returning guest, uh, my friend Jacob Vadrine, who has uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, participated in a two-part debate on Joseph Smith's polygamy. So we'll be um, having a bit of a debate debrief today. Just in terms of announcements, uh, hopefully next week I will have Tark and Core on to discuss uh, macro evolution and the philosophy behind that and other topics as well. So um, it will be a bit of a philosophical, scientific nerd out. So uh, be on the outlook for that. So uh, Jacob, uh, welcome back to the uh, channel. It's great to have you on again. It's good to be back. Um, of course, you participated in an episode a couple of months ago on Joseph Smith's uh, theology of animal sacrifice and its institution in the uh, future. But for those who may not know you, um, maybe if you were to give like a very brief um, introduction to who you're and uh, your interest in um, Mormon uh, studies. So um, I grew up in Utah. I was raised a Latter-day Saint. I am a, a Ross LeBaronite by terms of based on my personal faith community that I'm a part of. So I'm not mainstream Latter-day LDS, but we share a lot of commonalities and we both believe in all the things that Joseph Smith restored, all his revelations. We believe in that Brigham Young was Joseph Smith's legitimate successor and John Taylor and so forth. There's just nuances and other things. And so what got me into history is because the restoration, you know, in order to understand a lot of this doctrine, you do need to understand the history that's associated to in the historical context of different doctrines being restored. And plural marriage was probably one of the first things that actually bothered me when I started to deal with, um, as, a, as a young adult, starting to deal with my tough questions about what, you know, what, do I believe everything Joseph Smith restored? And I started to really dig into, say, Brian Hale's work on plural marriage. And there was a bunch of different websites out there, but I, I definitely appreciated Brian Hale's resources that he had put out. And, you know, and it's, you, you do kind of have to get into the history in order to understand some of the theology. Um, you know, and that that's just kind of what got me started in studying the history of, you know, you know, some of the historical areas of Mormonism. I never thought that plural marriage would be a subject because I personally am not, you know, that's not a, a field that is inter terribly interesting to me. I like, um, you know, the complex theologies about God that Joseph Smith and Brigham Young taught, um, you know, the different things about the priesthood that Joseph Smith taught, that Brigham Young taught, and so forth. And so plural marriage is kind of something that came up on my radar, basically, because over and over again, you would have people who would try to say, well, are we sure that Joseph, that I don't think there's good evidence that Joseph Smith introduced plural marriage. And, you know, this is originally, so the, these were people from the um, Denver snuffer affiliated um, fellowships who would be like that. And they weren't, they weren't too obnoxious about it. They were just, you know, sharing, they generally just shared their opinions respectfully and I could respectfully disagree. But in recent years, there's been a newer movement that is, I, I would say a fair bit more um, assertive and sometimes obnoxious about their claims where they think that they've got all the evidence on their side when they just haven't really studied the history as much as they think that they have. So and we'll, and sorry, we'll def oh, and we'll definitely discuss that group and its background uh, momentarily as well. Yeah, and so like like we we discussed last time, animal sacrifice, and that was you know for me, I, I want to look into the controversial areas of the restoration and try to um, you know see what I think about X, Y, or Z controversy. And animal sacrifice is obviously a controversial subject. And you you know, it's something that anti-Mormons occasionally will really use polemically against the restoration. And so, um, you know, plural marriage is another controversial subject and so forth. So. <laughs> now, of course, as I said, you participated on a two and two debate a few months ago um, on the topic of whether Joseph, first of all, practiced polygamy, but also taught polygamy. And we'll discuss that momentarily. But perhaps if you were to give like a very brief overview of like the history of the belief that Joseph was a strict monogamist, um, you know, maybe you were to discuss like its, histor its uh, historical background, but also why there's been a revival of this idea um, in recent years. Because, of course, the or LDS now community of Christ, they seem to just accept, yeah, he was a polygamist. All Latter-day Saint historians were their soul to have studied this topic will say 
yeah, he was a polling mist. Um, see Brian Hills as SC in response to Denver Snuffer, for instance, on that. Uh, you've written the EIA paper on your One Eternal Round uh, magazine, which I'll link to on Joseph Smith's Polygamy, like so they can actually see your take on these things. But um, why, perhaps if you could discuss, like, how come this idea first came about in the 19th century, and why all of a sudden there seems to be this, like, um, um, rebirth of this idea in um, some um, circles? So by all by by all accounts, plural marriage started in secret. It was not something that was introduced openly. Um, whether you are a Joseph Smith monogamous theorist or a polygamy skeptic or polygamy denier, whichever term you want to call it, or if you believe that Joseph Smith introduced polygamy, you know both camps admit that it was something that was introduced in secret. And so you have this problem of there were many pu public denials when rumors of about plural marriage begin to circulate. In fact, the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants references there are rumors about the Latter-day Saints and polygamy and DNC, the original section 101, where it says the law of the church is one man and one wife references these rumors and says, you know, we permit remarriage if a spouse dies, but we say one man, one wife is what the law of the church was. And that was in the original DNC. And so Joseph Smith, according to the history we have, was introducing plural marriage secretly as early as Kirtland. He was telling some people that we will eventually be practicing it. He, according to the sources, um, takes his first plural wife in Kirtland, Fanny Alger. The, date, the dating on that is not well established, but I personally agree more with like Don Bradley and Brian Hales that it was probably in 1836 when Joseph first entered into plural marriage with Fanny Alger. Um, but then in Nauvoo, he begins to expand his practice of plural marriage. He begins to ex authorize others to practice it. And this is all secretive. And so you start to have these rumors, you start to have allegations and um, you get start. And so there's these denials that are made in response to it. And, you know, you also have unauthorized polygamy going on and there's um, denials that are made that those things are not sanctioned by Joseph, which is true because John C. Bennett's what he was doing wasn't sanctioned by Joseph. But anyhow, so fast forward to Joseph's death. Plural marriage has not been publicly revealed to the church, though according to the history we have, it was the Revelation, DNC 132, was read to the High Council. Um, it wasn't ever published before Joseph Smith's death, but it was private. It began to be almost an open secret in Nauvoo. And so most of the saints in Nauvoo followed Brigham Young out to Utah and in winter quarters and in early Utah, they began to be more public about it. And in 1852, it finally, DNC 132 is publicly published and the pull of marriage is publicly taught in church publications at that time. And in contrast, there were some saints who learned about plural marriage being introduced in Nauvoo and were skeptical about some of Joseph's new Nauvoo doctrines, particularly polygamy, and they didn't follow Brigham Young out west because they knew that Brigham Young was somebody who was a believer in polygamy. And so these different groups, you know, there were different claimants during the succession crisis. You had James Strang, you had Sidney Rigdon, you had different people who were opposed to polygamy in the succession crisis. And ultimately, all those breakoffs at that time did dwindle into, um, you know, they, they fizzled out and they didn't continue very long but a lot of the, but the sentiment by many of the saints who were not too fr thrilled with the newer things in Nauvoo particularly polygamy that they 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 were still around and they began to consolidate in a movement called the reorganized movement um, where they believed that the church needed to be reorganized without the problems that they saw in the Nauvoo doctrines. And that ultimately became the RLDS church. They wanted Joseph the third to step forward and lead their movement. And Emma was one of the people who was not particularly happy about plural marriage being introduced. And so she raised her sons to be against it. And so they really codified, um, you know, the, R the reorganized movement being against polygamy, but more the Joseph the third codified that, he didn't believe that his father was a polygamist. While there were other members in the early reorganization who believed that Joseph was a polygamist, 
Joseph the third said, I believe my father was a good man and my a good man wouldn't have practiced polygamy. So I can't believe that my father was a polygamist. So it wasn't an objective position. It was an emotional position based off of his own um, personal feelings towards his family. And that position won out in the RLDS church, though there were early leaders in the RLDS church that admitted that Joseph did introduce polygamy, but those leaders died off and Joseph the third's position took root in that movement. And they, you know, wrote against the, the Brighamites, you know, Utah Mormonism to, you know, who were, who were writing in defense of the historicity of Joseph Smith's polygamy. And there was kind of this um, war back and forth on this issue of whether Joseph Smith taught and practiced polygamy. Um, later on, the RLDS church in the early 1900s began the, some of the apostles and um, other historians in the RLDS church began to see the historical problems with this narrative that had been started by Joseph Smith III, that his father had never practiced polygamy. And they know they knew the expo the Nauvoo Expositor was very problematic. They knew that Joseph Smith's response to the Expositor in June of 1844 also was problematic. And they knew that there was other evidence outside of the Brighamites, the Utah Mormonism of Joseph Smith's polygamy. And so eventually the RLDS church in the 1900s, uh, I think, you know, somewhere after, you know, the in the late 1900s, eventually became, we can't hold this narrative anymore. We have to admit that, yes, Joseph Smith was a polygamist. No, we don't believe in polygamy, but we have to admit that not everything he did not everything he did was sanctioned by the church. Not everything he did was sanctioned by God is kind of what their new position was. And this shook a lot of different um, faithful members of the RLDS, along with some of their other cultural shifts in the RLDS church, where they shifted, uh, particularly women's ordination was another big straw that broke a lot of the camel's backs for these um, traditionalist members. And so they're that they kind of fragmented away from the RLDS church, along with them abandoning patriarchal succession, where they, they stopped having a descendant of Joseph Smith be their president. I understand. So that also, those are the three big things, you know, women's ordination, abandoning, you know, Joseph Smith, the Joseph Smith monogamous narrative, and, um, and, uh, and abandoning patriarchal succession. My main mind went blank there for a second, but yeah, so so basically the RLDS church had to uh, abandon this position, and overall the historical community, as more documents have come out from Utah Mormonism and you know the new Mormon history of really getting into all of the sources and really weighing and crit you know applying critical analysis to the sources, you know, historically it's totally undeniable that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And that's what the RLDS church had to admit eventually. Um, and that's what the mainstream historical position opinion is now today. Um, do you want me to get into the resurgence of why there's been uh, why this opinion has started to come back in the modern in the last several decades? Uh, please, if you would. So in the last couple of decades, this position has um, resurfaced first with the prices work. They wrote the book, um, Joseph Smith Fought Polygamy, and I think they have two or three volumes where it's defending the traditional RLDS narrative and kind of resurrecting it. And they, they're kind of going off of, there were some RLDS leaders who didn't want to abandon the narrative. And they, they felt that they're kind of continuing that um, lost position of the RLDS church. And so the price has really resurrected it. Um, the next person I think that resurrected it was um, Alan Waterman, who's Alan Rock Waterman, who does the Pure Mormonism blog. I don't know if you've ever seen that before, but he was almost like a, a proto snufferite in that he was more of against the, in, it, he was more of a free spiritual, not um, institutional church kind of views that, that snuffer also promotes. And so between Alan Rock Waterman and um, Denver Snuffer, they really took hold of this um, Joseph Smith monogamous narrative and they resurrected it. And, you know, with the internet, it's really taken off. 
And um, more recently, there's been the Doctrine of Christ movement, which also heavily promotes this narrative. And when it comes to history, um, have you seen the, the 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 cartoon comic that says that has the line a huge line of people going down a path that says with an arrow that says simple but wrong, and then a whole line uh, not a whole line but a very few people going down the op this other path that says complex but right and above it answers. So most people prefer a simple but wrong over a complex but right answer to looking at history. And of course we have Occam's razor where the simplest explanation is most likely the correct one, but you need the simplest explanation that accounts for all of the data. You need to have a holistic approach to history rather than um, a very, um, I forgot the term that Brian Hales used, but he basically, he, he thought that, um, he Brian Hales did a good presentation a couple of years ago, kind of summarizing um, the tactic of um, Denver Snuffer of, as being a breadcrumb trail of evidence where I want you to focus on one source and then this other source and then this other source that I'm leading you along to thinking that I'm, you know, that I've got the truth instead of taking the totality of all of this evidence and weighing it according to the totality of sources. And so history is, is very difficult. And I got into studying polygamy denial, particularly because it just kept coming up on, over and over again in historical discussions. Well, personally, polygamy isn't an issue that concerns me a, a whole lot. It's not a doctrine that I really care a whole lot about um you know it's not really my emphasis i would say but i would but the history is in my opinion it's used as a wedge to try to tear down the restoration of you know the the restoration by joseph smith where it's a wedge issue to first kind of get people to be questioning you know the nauvoo teachings of joseph smith and also the priesthood and also the the organization of the church etc cetera, etc cetera. And so that's why it became an important issue for me to study. And I began to interact with other scholars on this issue who, um, who specialized in um, polygamy denial and kind of understanding the big problems with this um, polygamy denial narrative. So, um, yeah, I think that covers the what where it's come from. And I've over the last couple of years, I've just started really digging into this issue just because it is something that these people really do make a big issue. It's not something that I would want to make a big issue, but something that they make a big issue. No, I so. appreciate that. Um, because like, we'll be discussing, like say some of the evidences for and against um, Joseph being a monogamist and a polygamist, but I think it's always important to know the intellectual history, even briefly for any topic. Um, <laughs> but so, yeah, I do appreciate that. And also like, um, as I said, you wrote a paper on this as part of your one eternal ground periodical. So I'll include a link to that so people will actually know um, the your approach to these particular uh, issues as well. But you also mentioned like how you're going to be having a new YouTube channel addressing uh, Joseph Smith, polygamy denials. Do you want to briefly uh, mention that? Yeah, so I, I've just started a, a channel just barely today called Debunking Polygamy Denial. And it's basically because this has grown to such a big issue that I want to create a platform that is trying to be a thorough and comprehensive response to this growing movement because there is, so I appreciate the work of say Brian Hales and He's other historians who have done all the great work that they've done on Joseph Smith's polygamy. Like his, his three volume set is great and I can't yeah, recommend uh, it. Uh, Br Br Brian is brilliant. Uh, so is Don Bradley. Yeah, yeah. D Don was his research assistant yeah. and said they compiled over 3000 sources for Joseph Smith's polygamy and trying to work on this in the, I believe it was in the nineties when they started. Um, so I appreciate the, the, the mainstream academic historical work on it, but they really don't interact enough with the polygamy skeptics or polygamy deniers. I, I, I polygamy denier can be seen as a per, uh, um, a, a polemic word or a, 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 a name, but for me, you're a skeptic if you say, I'm not sure about something. You become a denier when you 
have all this evidence presented to you and you say, I don't care about this evidence. I'm going to keep repeating my, my I'm going to keep repeating what I was repeating before you told me this evidence, you know? Um, so, so they, so Brian's great and his response to Denver Snuffer is great, but I don't think it really answers the, the, you know, it doesn't respond in a way that would be compelling to people who are in the polygamy skeptic camp. Like they don't really care too much about your Utah Mormonism testimony because they, they want to believe that everyone's just under the, the thumb of Brigham Young and that, you know, all these women were coerced to give their testimony. Um, but if I say, well, what about, um, you know, William Marks who didn't follow Brigham Young? What about Ebenezer Robinson who didn't follow Brigham Young? And they were in the RLDS church and they didn't like polygamy. And yet they testified that they knew Joseph and Hiram taught it. And, you know, those are the types of things when you can compile all the non Brighamite evidence and you, and it paints the exact same picture or the very similar picture to what the evidence from Utah Mormonism, that just, you know, that that's like a second witness that makes it beyond any historical doubt. That yeah. That, that would be a very strong conversions uh, from different sources. Yeah. So that's always important. Yeah. So um, some, some might label me a, a, a Mormon fundamentalist, but I would actually, sometimes I, I quiz at that label because I d disagree with a lot of fundamentalists on the super emphasis on polygamy. And I also disagree with this narrative that is promoted in kind of fundamentalist Mormonism, where everyone has to live, accept and live plural marriage in this life, or they can't be exalted or they can't go to the celestial kingdom. And so th this is something that I got from studying Brigham Young's teaching and studying Lyman White's teachings is that they taught that um, it's, it's a common misconception that they said you have to live polygamy to go to to be exalted in the celestial kingdom. That's what you'll hear from polygamy deniers. That's something that you might hear from anti-Mormons, but that's not an accurate assessment of what Brigham Young taught. Brigham Young said that um, that monogamous could be exalted just as well as, as faithful polygamists. He taught that exaltation was about your family. It's, it's a, a, it's a fat, it's a continued family relationship is what exaltation ultimately is. Um, yeah, and he said that those who have a larger family ha will have a greater exaltation in that context of, of what was taught in early Utah regarding um, family. But at the same time, they said that it's ultimately what's most important is your faithfulness. And Brigham Young said that a man who doesn't have a wife or only has one wife, as long as he's faithful, will get all the glory that he is, you know, th that he is worthy of. You know, he, he said that um, he, he I'm trying to find the 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 right um, quote on that, but Lyman White similarly taught the same thing, where they both taught that monogamous could be exalted and that polygamy was just kind of a greater exaltation, but they still shared the same glory. And so when I have Lyman White, who didn't follow Brigham Young and broke away in 1844 and went to Texas, and Brigham Young in Utah teaching the same doctrine, that is pretty strong evidence that to me that that doctrine went back to Joseph Smith, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, so uh, I feel like I went on a tangent there. Did I go on a tangent? <laughs> uh, yeah, but it's it's fine. Like uh, I just I want this episode to be as informed as possible. So like uh, these tangents are more than welcome. But um, so before we kind of discuss the debate, um, you mentioned like the doctrines of Christ group, and I believe the two gentlemen that you debated are part of this group. Uh, for those who may not be too familiar with the doctrines of Christ group, um, how would they differ from like say? The mainstream LDS church, you know, are they just, is it just simply polygamy denial and that's it? Or is there like more substantial differences between them and say the LDS and other groups that believe Brigham was Joseph's successor? So I actually think that both members, both people we debated, um, so it was me, the debate was me and Mark Tensmeyer, and Mark Tensmeyer is mainstream, um, mainstream LDS versus um, Leo Ebert and Jeremy Hoop. J Jeremy Hoops, and he, I understand that both of them are more in the Denver snuffer views. Like they weren't, I don't think, I, I don't think any of them, well, okay. I think Jeremy, okay. Jeremy might be more affiliated with Dr. Christ because he actually was involved with the latest um, Who Killed Joseph Smith part two film. So he, 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 maybe at the end of this, at the, at the end of this podcast, we can maybe play the clip where he talks at the end and then I can just briefly respond to what he says. I don't know if you saw the post-credits 
scene with him. If you did, did you happen to see that? I unfortunately watched it. So yeah, um, you you you, like <laughs> you, you, you can line it up, and we'll like uh, have a screen share at the end. But yeah, we can definitely do that. But like, um, of course, this so was so so their theology, um, it, it's it's very much um, you know gr- they they th- there's a very anti-hierarchy view among the doctrine of Christ and um, snufferites where they almost feel like um, Joseph Smith introducing a church government in their view is almost like giving a lesser law to the people. And they think that almost the church was in its most pristine state in like 1829, 1830. And then, um, you know, it's like this progressively, um, you know, adding all these things. And, And I guess, what they would compare it to maybe possibly would be like Israel getting a king where um, it wasn't something that God in um, first Samuel said that he intended, but because the people wanted, you know, deserved it or whatever. But I, I don't personally agree, subscribe to that opinion, obviously, and neither do you, but that's kind of the perspective they come from where it's uh, against this um, institutional hierarchy and church government. That is uh, a really, that's one of the big, theological views and it's also a get back to a lot of, for doctrine of christ and snuff rights to a degree their big emphasis is on the book of mormon and trying to get you know so they really emphasize spiritual experiences i think what that's what both groups really emphasizes um so joseph smith taught this doctrine of um this the second comforter where people can have jesus christ appear to them in the flesh um certain worthy individuals and they really, really emphasize that, like way more than Joseph Smith ever emphasized it. And that's a really big thing that commonality that both communities really have is this emphasis on you need to have your own baptism of fire as a, um, a, as a big um, outpouring of the spirit kind of experience. And then you need to continue to um, hunger and thirst after righteousness and um endure to the end until you get the and they they view enduring to the end as enduring until you get like the second comforter and they think that's kind of what the whole purpose of the gospel is pointing to is kind of having that um spirit you know these great spiritual manifestations and that's that's something both movements kind of have in common doctrine of christ um is a study group so denver snuffer obviously i think he was excommunicated about 2011 or 2012 from the church and then he, he started his own kind of fellowship movement. Doctor of Christ um, is more recent. It's I, I understand that there was a core kind of study group of, of several guys um, in the mid 2000, maybe about 2015, 2016. And um, when the pandemic hit, they, they really capitalized on that. And they really set up a bunch of social media channels to really proselytize and, um, you know, and, that kind of looked at looked to Phil Davis as a leader for a time, and um, Phil Davis he he's an individual who claims to have had these great theophanies and experiences with God the Father and Jesus Christ, and so that's why they kind of looked to him as a leader. But the movement in the last six to eight months is kind of separated from him, so the the, the movement's still around. But it, I think to continue to associate Phil Davis with it would be kind of uh, a mistake at this point, as they would, um, as as many members of this movement would say. And so d- the big things, another big difference between snufferites and Doctrine of Christ is I feel like den- people who are more in the Denver snuffer camp are, you know, that they, they're skeptical of Joseph Smith's polygamy. They, they will say they don't believe that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. And mostly it comes down to a personal view of morality where they uh, so it's resurrecting the RLS narrative. And the reason they do it is they, they, they have a testimony that Joseph Smith is a prophet, but they don't have a testimony of polygamy. And they really struggle with believing that polygamy could be of God or what is the history of it in Nauvoo, that that uh, what's alleged to have happened came from God. Um, Doctor and Christ kind of go a step further where they, accuse the apostles of, of murdering Joseph Smith, which is ridiculous. And that's never been mainstream RLDS position, but that is a much bolder claim. And I feel like some people think that if you, you the bull, as long as you, you know, you might, if you're going to go big with your, your bold historical denial, you know, if you're going to go big with your big historical claims based on minimal evidence, you might as well go as big as you can is what I feel like with that movement. 
But regarding, so a lot, I, I do think a lot of it, when you discuss the history of polygamy, you, you do need to address the morality of polygamy, because I do think it's a very emotional position where they have a testimony of Joseph Smith, but they can't believe that polygamy was moral or that Joseph was moral in his practice of it. And obviously, you and I are both students, uh, you know, we really are students of the Old Testament where we really studied all the stuff on animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. But if you also look at the polygamy in the Old Testament, you have to come to a similar conclusion that, you know, God clearly permitted polygamy in the Old Testament, even if it's forbidden to the Book of Mormon peoples. There clearly is some other context where God could permit plural marriage. And one of the verses they really like to contradict is Jacob 2, where it talks about David and Solomon, what they did being an abomination before the Lord, while um, of having many wives and concubines, while DNC 132 says that David and Solomon's big sin was what they received not from God. And it referenced David most particularly in the matter of Uriah. That was his big sin and that he fell from his exaltation because of that in DNC 132. But one thing that I would point out to individuals who are more in the polygamy skeptic camp is that the Joseph Smith translation of the Old Testament harmonize. So they see these two verses as contradicting, but the Joseph Smith translation provides, you know, this, this harmonization where um, in, in 1 Kings 15, 5, it basically says exactly what DNC 132 says about David. It says, quote, David did right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from all he commanded him to sin against the Lord, but repented of the evil all the days of his life, save only in the manner, matter of Uriah the Hittite, wherein the Lord cursed him. So the that's the JST of that verse, the original verse just says, David did that which was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, save only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. So Joseph Smith changed that verse and to clarify that David wasn't like perfect where he was sinless, but that he repented of his sins all his life. And the only sin he never fully could get out of condemnation for was in the matter of Uriah the Hittite, where he committed adultery and murder, right? And so... You know, and, it's, and so Joseph added, wherein the Lord cursed him. So that clearly harmon is a great way verse that harmonizes Jacob 2 and DNC 132 on um, on David, on Solomon. You know, he similar says about Solomon in the Old Testament that the thing that he was condemned for was having all these foreign wives that turned his heart away from the Lord. And, um, you know, you got to ask if polygamy is never permitted by God, but did God really walk and talk with Abraham and with Jacob in the Old Testament and not tell them that it was wrong? And do we really think that Moses permitted polygamy in the law of Moses, you know, without any explicit condemnation of it, you know, if, if it wasn't something that God was okay with at certain times. And so, I, I do take a Jacob 2 verse 30 perspective that that is saying that monogamy is the Lord's standard unless he commands and permits otherwise is kind of my, I, I agree with that interpretation of J Jacob 2.30 as a loophole verse. And just, just on that, uh, whenever I discuss like say section 132 and Jacob 2, um, I think it's pretty clear that Deuteronomy 17, the test for the ideal Davidic king using the background of Jacob 1 to 3. And that and in Deuteronomy 17, 17, there's a warning against multiplying, um, you know, not just uh, wives, but like horses and chariots and gold. But the Hebrew there is not like a lineal increase, like one, two, three. It refers to an exponential increase, like what Solomon did to the uh, pagans. So with that in mind as well, like with the use of Deuteronomy 17 and 18, something Ben McGuire hopefully will publish on in the near future, uh, and some others have published on as well. Uh, Jacob is not talking about like, uh, lineal increases in plural wives per se, but an exponential increase, uh, something that Solomon fell under, um, you know, and so forth. So I just saw a throw that in as well. Okay. Yeah. So, so, and then just uh, a Brigham Young quote that I really like when he talked on um, pl pl plural marriage um, in 1855, um, where he kind of explains the, the, let's see. Yeah, yeah. So I, I've just got a few quotes by Brigham Young that I thought was one of the best sermons on it. 
So I have a, a few words to say concerning one item of doctrine that I seldom think of mentioning before a public congregation. I refer to the doctrine pertained to raising up a royal priesthood to the name of Israel's God, for which purpose the revelation was given to Joseph concerning the right of faithful elders and taking to them themselves more than one wife. I frequently hear from others this doctrine is laughed at and ridiculed. I heard yesterday of it being laughed out of doors and even jeered and sneered at out of a bishop's house. I'm not personally cognizant of anyone jeering or, and deriding this doctrine. Still, I hear there are few who are opposed to it. Once in a while, sentiments reach my ear, which sound very curious and strange. And when I hear them, I do wish that some were possessed of better senses. I will therefore tell, tell you a few things that you should know. God never introduced the patriarchal order of marriage with a view to please man in his carnal desires, nor to punish females for anything which they had done. But he introduced it for the express purpose of raising up to his name a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. Do we not see the benefit of it? Yes, we have lived long enough to realize its advantage. Um, its advantages. Suppose I had the privilege of only one wife. I should have had only three sons, for those are all that my first wife bore, whereas I have now buried five sons and have 13 living. It is obvious that I could not have been blessed with such a family if I had been restricted to one wife. But by the introduction of this law, I can be the instrument of preparing tabernacles for those spirits which have come into this dispensation. Under this law, I and my brethren are preparing tabernacles for those spirits, sorry, um, which have been preserved to enter bodies of honor and be taught the pure principles of life and salvation. And those tabernacles will grow up and become mighty in the kingdom of God. So one thing I would sit, criticize um, on some apologetics regarding plural marriage is the the idea is that it's about some people mistakenly think it's about having more children it in a it's about certain righteous men having more children like you know these women would have had children even if they married someone else but brigham young says it's preferable for women to marry a priesthood holder and will raise the children in the gospel than to be married to someone who will not live up to those higher moral standards that the gospel requires of us so um the lord has instituted this plan for a holy purpose and not with a design to afflict or distress the people hence an important imperative duty is placed upon all holy men and women and the rewards will follow for it is said that the children will add to our honor and glory it hurts my feelings when i see good men who love correct principles and cling to the counsels of this church who have lived to god for years and have always been faithful with not a child to bear up their name to future generations and i grieve to reflect that their names must go into the grave with them it would, it would please me to see good men and women have families I would like to see righteous men have more wives and raise up holy children. Some says I would do so, but Brother Joseph and Brother Brigham have never told me to. This law was never given to the Lord for any but his faithful children. It's not for the ungodly at all. No man has a right to a wife or wives unless he honors his priesthood and magnifies his calling before God. I foresaw when Joseph first made known this doctrine that would be a trial and a source of great care and anxiety for the brethren. And what of that? We are to gird up our loins and fulfill this just as we would any other duty. It says that winds got in the way of him speaking for a few minutes. He says, it has been strenuously urged by many that this doctrine was introduced through lust, but that is a gross misrepresentation. This revelation, which God gave to Joseph, was for the express purpose of providing a channel for the organization of tabernacles for those spirits to occupy who had been reserved to come forth in the kingdom of God, that they might not be obliged to take tabernacles out of, out of the kingdom of God. We are commanded to overcome all our lustly, lustful desires, also our pride, our selfishness, and every evil propensity towards the pertaining to the flesh, and to keep the commandments of God and all the commandments pertaining to the holy priesthood. It is important that we get a victory over our earthly passions and learn to live by the law of God. And then he goes on to say, um, let's see. I don't want to read the whole thing. Um, but, but he goes on, I don't have the exact quote, I don't want to read the rest of it, but he goes on to say that a true saint of God, if he struggles with the revelation, like he doesn't think that it's been revealed to him, the truth of it, that you don't go throwing out the gospel because you struggle with a particular revelation. He says you should ask the Lord to give you patience to you know stay true to what you do know and you do have a testimony of until the Lord can give you further light and knowledge to accept everything that is revealed and to not and to have kind of this patience with yourself in you know accepting the revelations from god so that that was kind of the quote i was wanting to get to but i just didn't know where exactly it was in that particular discourse this was in um 
July 14th, 1855, if somebody wants to look up that discourse in either Complete Discourse or Brigham Young or the um, Journal of Discourses. So, so, yeah, I do think understanding the theology is just as important as understanding the history of it and to be, being able to obje- answer people's theological objections to it. And Brigham Young clearly says there that it's not for lust. It's it's because we're about trying to raise up more a royal priesthood unto God and to have more children to bear off the priesthood to the world was why um, the Lord commanded them to enter into polygamy in the early days of the church. So, oh, thanks for that. So that's kind of about going to the debates themselves. Uh, how did the debates go about, and how did you actually prepare yourself? for these uh, two debates. Because like speaking for myself as someone who's going to be debating hopefully soon in a few weeks on the Immaculate Conception uh, venue pending, um, it's not easy to prepare for a debate even if you know the topic very well. You guys, you have to have the timing down. You have to make sure you like, you you have to try, uh, you just have to focus on like say some kinds of information and have to fight that urge to like throw in everything all at once. So like, um, how did the debates come about? Were you, uh, did you volunteer for it? Were you approached to do it? And how did you prepare yourselves to uh, engage in the debates? So the debates, I was approached by Mark Curtis, who runs the Hemlock Knots website and Facebook group. And he, he approached me to participate in a debate about whether Joseph Smith um, taught and practiced polygamy or not. And um, I thought about it. I I, he basically said he wanted to do a two on two debate and he wanted a fair format to, you know, to allow both sides to interact and to represent and to be represented. And I, I personally was, was kind of skeptical because some of the guys on the other side can be very vicious and um, uh, irrational in their views. But I, I, I talked to, Mark Tensmeyer, who's a friend of mine who also was really big in studying the the polygamy denial movement and kind of responding to what they to to their claims, historical claims that we believe aren't factual or correct. Um, and he basically told me he, so so Mark Ten, so so we knew he t- we were told that Leo Eberts had agreed to be on the. Um, negative side arguing against Joseph's polygamy. And Mark Tensmeyer said, oh, Leo's a great guy. He's very respectful. He says, I, I'd be willing to participate in a debate with somebody like Leo. And so because Mark Tensmeyer said that, I was like, okay, if you're if you're you're on board with doing a respectful debate and if you think that we can, you know, have some respectful conversation with people on the other side of this issue, then yeah, I'd love to do it because there hadn't really been up to that point and there still hasn't been since that point a real solid debate between the Joseph Smith monogamist versus the Joseph Smith was a polygamist camp. And so this really was a, a groundbreaking debate and I I had my reservations because Hemlock Knots as a website is very anti Brigham Young, I, I would say they're very, a very um, antagonistic website and polemic in their representation of data. And I couldn't disagree with their timelines on their website enough about, say, polygamy, about tithing. I don't think that they're very accurate, in my personal opinion. Um, but I was willing to take the venue to um, have, uh, you know, this debate that hadn't been had before. And so this it was definitely a really big struggle figuring out how to s- format the debate to be um, you know to break down the issues and what information to present. And I really learned. So this was probably this was my first debate theological debate I've ever been in was the first debate, which is did Joseph Smith practice polygamy? And then we decided the second debate would be centered on did Joseph Smith teach polygamy, and to break it down, there isn't one single source that is like a shot, you know, irrefutable, um, indisputable source that Joseph Smith practiced polygamy. It's the multitude of all the sources, of all the wives' testimony, all the other participants who were performing these marriages or were involved with, um, you know, getting jo- getting the w- wife to consent to the marriage proposal, 
or um, you know the contemporary documents about these plural marriages because there there is some contemporary sources to support the existence of these marriages in Nauvoo. And so it was a struggle to figure out how to break it down. And basically during the first debate, we agreed to leave out DNC 132 and the William Clayton journals out, out of the conversation because really, while those are evidence of Joseph Smith practicing polygamy in both section 132 and the William Clayton journals, those are more about Joseph teaching it to others. Like William Clayton really documents Joseph teaching polygamy while he has a few references to Joseph's practicing of polygamy. So we agreed to leave those out of the first debates. And as we were figuring out how to format it, I basically, we basically said, let's break it down into our two arguments being um, the contemporary sources and really emphasizing that there are contemporary sources of Joseph Smith's plural wives. And then secondly, that there are some third party, some compelling third party witnesses to Joseph Smith practicing polygamy. And so the contemporary sources, what I, I presented on that, um, while, while my debate partner, Mark Tensmeyer, um, presented on the, um, the, the later third party testimony. And I learned the hard way that 10 minutes is a very short amount of time to cover um, even just five historical documents I, I or, or 10 historical documents. Yeah, I think I agreed that I would only talk about 10 sources. And so and I didn't even have time to talk about all 10 of my sources. Like one of my sources that I didn't get time to talk about was the Nauvoo Temple ceilings records. That isn't something that's ever used as evidence in early Utah for these women being sealed to Joseph Smith because that's, you know, sacred temple records. They aren't going to throw those out and, you know, who's and the, um, you know, the anti-polygamists aren't going to believe those anyway. But anyhow, I, I, I showed that John C. Bennett lists a number of Joseph Smith's wives in 1842, and he lists both Brigham Young and Joseph B. Noble as being people who performed those marriage, two of those marriages. And John C. Bennett in and of himself is not a compelling witness. But when you have multiple of these women later on testifying that yes, they were Joseph's wives. When you have most of these women having their ceilings to Joseph Smith ratified in the Nauvoo temple. And when you have some contemporary other documents like Brigham Young's journal recording Joseph Smith's marriage to Agnes Smith, it's the interconnection of all of these sources supporting each other and painting the, painting, painting the same picture that presents this overwhelming and indisputable case that Joseph Smith did teach and practice polygamy. Um, so I, I didn't have time to fully lay that out in 10 minutes. I, I tried to, but I, I, I didn't really get to. Um, Mark Tensmeyer didn't want to just try to throw out all of the sources. He's like, I've only got 10 minutes, so I'm going to just pick two highly credible third-party witnesses. And the two he picked, if I'm remembering right off the top of my head, are William Marks, who says that yeah, it's Joseph admitted that he introduced this. Um, and then he also picked um, Lyman White's son, Orange White, who was trying to court as a young man in Nauvoo, Flora Woodworth, and he's trying to court her. And he finds out, he basically gets pulled in by her mother and told she is a plural wife of Joseph Smith. And, you, you know, he finds out that these girls were kind of um, referencing themselves as, as spirituals, referencing being spiritual wives. And so he is a good, um, a, a third, a third party witness. So he went to Texas. He, he actually did enter into polygamy. He and his father, Lyman White, both practiced polygamy in Texas. And then Orange White later gathered to Utah and became a part of the, the church under Brigham Young in Utah. So I thought that was a pretty great idea to use him as a source by uh, Mark Tensmeyer. And so the opponents... If I'm re remembering their two big evidence against Joseph Smith's polygamy was um, the first one was the lack of DNA offspring, if I'm remembering right, was their first big argument. And with that, you know, that would seem that's something that a lot of polygamy deniers would use as a big smoking gun, recent piece of evidence to question the narrative that Joseph Smith was a polygamist. That's what they'll say is, this is new evidence. We have the DNA test saying that he didn't father any of these children. But the problem is, none of those are 
even good candidates. Like it's the ones that were tested. There were only, I believe, five individuals who were tested. And four of them are like very vague, late family traditions. We don't even know where the idea comes from that these people were speculated that they might be a child of Joseph Smith. And then the fifth one, the best candidate was Josephine Lyon, who is uh, in the early 1900s, is recalling several decades earlier, her mother had said that she is, was on her deathbed, that she was the daughter of Joseph Smith. And so this is a very late third hand account that she's giving. And if Brian Hills has done some good work in response to the DNA test saying that, yes, it, you know, she wasn't really the offspring of Joseph Smith. She was the offspring of her legal husband. Um, and, and Brian Hills shows that her younger sister, who was born, who was conceived and born several years after Joseph Smith's death, also was considered to be spiritually the daughter of Joseph Smith. And so could Josephine Lyon rather or her or her mother be lying? She could have um misinterpret so so it, something could have been lost in translation of her mother saying you're spiritually you know you you are because i'm sealed to joseph for eternity you are going to be joseph's daughter eternally is kind of what could have been lost over the years in memory or recalling that conversation and so she's the best only decent candidate and she's still not a great candidate and in utah mormonism in early utah mormonism they didn't try to say Joseph was a polygamist. Here are his children. You know, Brigham Young didn't know that there would be DNA tests 150 years later. They could have made up alleged children if they wanted to bolster this narrative, but they didn't. And that wasn't part of their claims. They, they, the earliest sources about Joseph Smith and having potential children are that, no, he didn't really have children. And, you know, we didn't, we don't know why. And, you know, Brian Hills and his work speculates that Joseph, you know, there was only really a two year period of Joseph Smith practicing polygamy before his death. And I think Mark Tensmeyer brought up a great point in rebuttaling this, um, the DNA evidence as a point where it just a single monogamous couple statistically has to have generally a certain number of sexual encounters to have a child have a child it's like just having one sex one or two sexual encounters is not often enough to conceive statistically um like it's it's very improbable i guess would, would be the term just, just having sex once and getting pregnant i mean it can happen but it's just not the most probable outcome of having sex one time and so he, he he showed really the statistical data that Joseph, you know, to make it go from, to change the improbability window, you'd have to assume that he's having a lot more, a, a ton of sexual encounters with his poor wives, when really we have no reason or evidence to believe that he was having a lot of sexual encounters with his wives. He may have had, there, there is some decent evidence of sexuality in Joseph Smith's polygamy, where the Partridge sisters said that they, um, room, that they were at wives in very deed. And uh, Joseph B. Noble said he knew that she, um, what the wife he sealed to Joseph, that she and him shared the same bed. Um, and so there's some decent evidence of sexuality. And what Benjamin F. Johnson also says similar, but that doesn't mean that it was, a, that there was a high frequency of sexuality, but just because there's some evidence that there was some sexuality. And my opinion I, I've, I've, there's, you know, obviously different scholarly positions on this. Um, D. Michael Quinn uh, is kind of, we, we all, in one of the pre-debate meetings, um, kind of talked about, you know, D. Michael Quinn thought Joseph was having so much sex that he was infertile and that everyone laughed at that, thought that was, uh, that's a ridiculous theory, you know, that to have, you know, that you're just having so much sex that you can't get anyone pregnant. That's, that that's, that's laughable. And I think Brian Hills is a lot more credible in his view of Joseph Smith's polygamy than um, D. Michael Quinn's perspective on it personally. Um, and yeah, so, so that's that point. What was the, was there other point? The, um, do you remember what their second big point was in the first debate about what Joseph Smith not being a polygamist? Uh, was, it, was, it, was it the polygamy denials? What was it? The Was it the denial statements? Yeah, I think the polygamy dolls did come up in one of the debates. 
I know they definitely came up in the second debate. Okay. Um, I'm I'm fuzzy on the on the the first debate um, because this was um, last summer, and so I'm, I'm trying I'm I'm fuzzy on it. But if it is the polygamy denial statements, you know, um, I think Mark Tensmeyer reference responded to the Emma's denials where um, you know because they they would quote like Joseph the Third and Emma. And and use those as supporting evidence of the um, of the public denials in Nauvoo, and um, Emma kind of is interesting in that um, Emma Emma I think maybe what they might have done if I'm remembering right is they might have been trying to tear down um, the 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 Partridge sisters' claims to being the wives if, if I'm remembering right they wanted to t talk about. Um, you know, try to debunk different aspects of the Partridge sisters testimony. Uh, um, uh, yeah. I think it's, it was basically testimonies about sexuality. That's one of the points they raised as well. Yeah. 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 So they, they brought up some of these things and Mark, I felt responded to those pretty well. I, I also responded in that, um, you know, he tried to point out that the date was off for her saying that, Emma was present for us being sealed to Joseph Smith on X date. And he was like, this is a smoking gun that he's, she's lying because Emma wasn't there and Joseph wasn't there or, or, or judge Adams wasn't there. You know, he, he basically brought up some contemporary evidence that that date wouldn't work in like May of 1843 for a, a ceiling for them to be sealed in the presence of Emma. And personally, I didn't have a problem with that because it, I think you know, they could have been guessing on their resealing date. And the other big reason is that William Clayton's journal actually says that Emma had it in August, is either in July or August of 1843, that Emma said that she would have given the Partridge sisters to Joseph as wives. But Joseph said that if he would have accepted, she would have pitched a fit and divorced him. And, you know, that, that's kind of getting into the conflict between Joseph and Emma over plural marriage in 1843 and William Clayton's journals really document that. And so that shows that by the late summer of 1843, that there was, hadn't yet been this resealing if there was a resealing of, of, M, of the Partridge sisters. And so it could have been in the spring of 1844. It could have been in late 1843. We don't know, but this is the, the thing about studying history is it's very messy and there's a lot of, different sources and you got to put them together. And if, and so William Clayton, if his journal had been a later Utah for, for, for fabrication, he wouldn't have an entry like that, that contradicted the, the story of them being resealed. Like he would, if they were making that in Utah, they would say, oh yes, Emma approved of this ceiling and, you know, and, and she gave these wives to Joseph Smith. And now personally, I do believe that she did actually give wives to Joseph Smith and partly because of the Utah testimony, but also because James Whitehead in 1874 also testified to this, where he was talking to W.W. Blair, and who's a leader of the RLDS movement, and he admits that Joseph taught and practiced polygamy. And with it, this didn't actually come up in the debate. I never actually mentioned um, Whitehead's testimony to W.W. Blair Um you know, being very problematic because for, for their side, because later on in the Temple Lot case, he denies ever having any knowledge of Joseph Smith being involved with polygamy in the Temple Lot case. Um, yet, so so let me read this quote. This is from W.W. W. Blair's journal, diary, June 17th, 1874, in the Community of Christ Library Archives. Um, why, and so this is shorthand, but Phil, you know, filling out the blanks in the shorthand, filling out the full words. Whitehead says Joseph did teach polygamy and practice too, that Emma knows it too, that she put hand of wife in Joseph's hand. Whitehead says Alexander H. Smith asked him when sleeping with him at his house in Alton, if Joseph did practice and teach polygamy and he, Whitehead, told him that he did. Now what's interesting about that is the scholar H. Michael Markwart um, actually looked in the um, Alexander Smith diary and found that on May 14th, 1864, that Whitehead did stay with Alexander Smith. This is one of Joseph Smith's sons. And he he writes in his journal that Whitehead told me many things that 
are hard to, or that I, I do not get and that are difficult to understand. And then there's a page torn out of his journal after that. And so you don't have that in Brighamite Mormonism where you have paid, you know, the, 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 he's telling me something that doesn't quite fit what I'm, I'm the Utah narrative and then the journal's torn out. That's not something that comes up in the Utah documents. That's something that is comes up several times with um, tampering with documents where we we are missing, like Lyman White's journal is totally missing. All we have are certain extracts of it to com to support patriarchal succession by the RLDS Church. The rest of the journal was lost. Um, you have other allegations by other members of the RLDS Church of documents being tampered with. So I, I guess that kind of covers, you know, the response to the, to the first debate. Like, like I said, the biggest, the, the lack of DNA evidence is one of the biggest points to support their side. But when you realize that it's not really as big as they make it out to be, and that, you know, it wasn't something that was a part of the Brighamites in early Utah's claims was that there were children of Joseph Smith. You know, it's not really a, a big point. So that kind of covers the first debate. The second debate. Well, actually, before was, I go to the uh, second debate, um, okay. You, if uh, if you were like to say to you argue for the uh, Joseph Smith was a monogamous side, do you think they would be the two points you would raise as the two best arguments, or do you think? You know, maybe the steel man wants uh, opponents. Do you think that there could be like a better? I know we both believe Joseph Smith was a polygamist. Yeah. So that's not in the debate, but do you think there could be a better argument, or do you think there could be like um, a way to nuance the arguments beyond this, or do you think that really is the best they have to offer on this particular topic? So, uh, the the two biggest arguments. The, the way that I would argue it, I don't think it's tenable to say that that there was no sealings done in Avu. And, and, and actually, I do think that was their second point. Did they argue sealings, not polygamy? Was yeah, their second yeah. point? Were sealings okay. related to polygamy, not these. Okay, now, now I'm remembering. Their, their second point was they were arguing that there were sealings, not polygamy. And that that those two points, I do believe, are the best way to argue it. First of all, lack of DNA evidence, any children. Um, and and like he said, he there, he said found problems with some of the the testimony in the Temple Lot case, and you know that that's how I would do it if I was arguing his position. I would definitely go that same route. And then the other thing, you know, obviously ceilings not polygamy, and I do have a source that would support that in that um, James Whitehead in 1885 when he confirms to Joseph the Third privately that there was definitely a revelation that um, was written in the handwriting by William Clayton about plural marriage. And he Whitehead, according to Joseph III's journal, which is biased, but I'm, I'd, I'd be willing to use it. He does say that the revelation was on ceilings, not polygamy. Or, well, he said for eternal companionship, not for this world is kind of what Whitehead tried to say. And I think that's true in a context where you have many of these rev these marriages where I think Whitehead actually saw the, ju the July 27th, 1843 revelation for Joseph to marry Sarah Ann Whitney. I think that's the document he saw, a one-page document in William Clayton's handwriting. And he alleges that this is the document that Emma burned. I don't know how he would know that. He wasn't really as involved as he might um, claim to be. But anyhow, I do think that like Sarah Ann Whitney, um, I'm not sure her age, but I'm, she was in her later teens, I think, at that time. Um, I think she might have been 18, if or uh, if I'm if I'm not mistaken. Um, but then you also have like Helen Mark Kimball, and you have Flora Woodworth, who are also in that later teen, um, you know, who are who are in their later teens. And I do think that these the evidence overwhelmingly is that these marriages to young girls were dynastic in nature and not. Um, consummated, like some of the older wives, in my opinion. And so I, I do think like with Flora Woodworth, having to basically explain to her and to um, Orange White that, you know, she's married to Joseph Smith, she shouldn't be flirting with other boys. And say Helen Mark Kimball had to have it be later explained to her that, you know, you're, you're, you shouldn't be going to dances with with boys. And she kind of was surprised by that. I think that only makes sense 
in the context of these being dynastic marriages. And with Flora, um, Emma got upset about Joseph giving her a watch, according to Clayton's journal. And then the very next day, she marries someone else. And so uh, there were some other sources on that that showed that it was mainly for an eternal connection between the families rather than it being a, you know, a, a sexual uh, emphasis of these marriages with. And so like, hell, yeah, Helen Mark Kimball, you know, Flora Woodworth, um, Sarah and Whitney, I think a lot of these were more meant to be dynastic, but, and, and for heaven, which I would say is a good argument, but you have to ask yourself if these ceilings, polygamous, polygamy ceilings are okay in heaven, then why is it really too big of a stretch to say that Joseph could have also been okay with polygamy ceilings on earth? Because like Brigham Young said that the great thing about what Joseph Smith's cosmology was, he was bringing heaven down to earth and uniting the two in his, you know, he, he wasn't just leaving it a big mystery that couldn't be explained, but he was actually, you know, really explaining heavenly things and really uniting heaven and earth with his theology. So, you know, that is the argument I would use. I, I think that um, Meg Stout, I think, tries to argue that most, most if not all, of the um, merit, plural marriages were for eternity only. So that is how I would definitely steel man that is I, I would. And so there was actually, I saw a comment, somebody commented on the debate. Hey, both sides, this isn't fair. Both sides both think that Joseph was sealed to other all these women. And he says, it's just whether he actually um, was living, you know, living those relations on this, you know, in this world or not, you know, is what one of the comments was. So. No, uh, no, I appreciate that. So uh, the second debate was whether Joseph actually taught um, the practice of polygamy to others. And of course, the first topic is, of course, the authenticity of Section 132. So, and also the other issues like the reliability of William Clayton, other topics came up. So uh, if you want to give an overview of your arguments and also their arguments and how do you think um, you both fared on that in respect? So, and I would just say with the first debate, I, I definitely feel like the other side were a lot more polished in their presentation. I think me and, and Mark Tensmeyer were not quite as polished or prepared for the debate format, but we definitely learned from the first debate. And in our opinion, the second debate was a far better debate. I think there was some tweaking with the format where there was more interaction between the two sides. If I, if I remember right, there was some slight tweaking. And there also wasn't any limitation of topics. Like um, we didn't say we're only going to limit ourselves to these sources. We're not going to talk about the, you know, X, Y, or Z in relation to them. And so the second debate was really about, um, I think there were four points um, that that come up. And that the, I, I think the, the big two things we debated were, were DNC 132 authentic and where it was William Clayton's journals, a reliable source for plural marriage being taught by Joseph Smith. And then I think Mark Tensmeyer near the end um, wanted to cover um, miscellaneous historical. Oh, oh, so it was the three. I'm, I'm now remembering the, 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 the third issue was ceilings or polygamy, whether which one did Joseph teach. And Mark Tensmeyer really wrapped up that debate by bringing up all of the different sources that he wanted to include that we didn't get to cover. And so the second debate was by far, if you had to pick one of the two debates, I think the second debate was the way better debate. And it's not just because I feel like, I, I do feel like we, we won the second debate and we didn't do as well in the first debate, but I also think both sides were better able to present all the their arguments in the second debate. I don't think that me and Mark Tensmeyer were able to fully lay out our views as well in the first debate. So, you know, in the second debate, but there is still the time constraints. And so we 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 learned from the first debate about the time constraints. And we I really picked and you know, I was like, okay, these are my big points I've got to cover with Clayton. These are my big points with DNC 132 being an authentic revelation. Um, with, with DNC 132, I still had to leave out a lot of stuff. Like I, there's so much other evidence that DNC 132 is legitimate and not a later fabrication. Um, you know, the, the, it, it's, it's one of the 
you know, it's one of the most theologically rich sections of the Doctrine and Covenants, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, the big things that I, I, I wanted to pick out the points that were probably would be the most compelling to the other side, to somebody who's in the skeptic camp is, and so I really, first I emphasized the expositor testimony and, you know, because that's the contemporary descriptions of the revelation on polygamy. I also talked about, um, I mentioned the Utah testimony, but more important than the Utah testimony is from the, the Nauvoo High Council who also heard the revelation read on August 12th, 1843. Besides the, I think there's five or six people who came to Utah who were present and gave affidavits that they knew that it was read. You also have three different individuals who didn't follow Brigham Young, who rejected the revelation, and they all gave their testimony that, yes, this revelation was read to the Nauvoo High Council. And you had William Marks, who became member of the RLDS Church First Presidency. That's, you know, he's he's a Nauvoo, he was the Nauvoo State President. He's a very credible witness. And when he says that Hiram read the revelation and he saw the High Council accepted it, but I didn't. You know, that's a compelling witness. Secondly, um, Austin Cowles, who was with the expositor, who didn't you know, obviously didn't accept it. And then also you had Leonard Sobey, who didn't follow the RLDS church. He was briefly a follower of Sidney Rigdon. He gave two different affidavits. And the first affidavit was to a RLDS apostle who was wanting to go to him and say, these Utah people are saying that this revelation was read. We want to know if you agree or not. And Sobe confirmed it. He said, yes, I'm reading the revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants 132. That appears to me to be the exact same revelation that was read to me those, those many years ago. And so that is, you know, it was damning enough to this apostle, Zenus Gurley Jr., that he resigned from his apostleship in the RLDS church. Imagine if a Utah apostle went out east and encountered Joseph the Third and Emma and talked to them, and then it's like, wow, they convinced me that polygamy didn't happen. I'm resigning my apostleship. If that would have happened, that would be an extremely, you know, significant thing, but you don't have that kind of thing happen in Utah Mormonism. You know, there's no evidence of any high-ranking leader changing their mind on Joseph Smith practicing polygamy. So, you know, so so, and then finally, the final piece of evidence that I used was that the um, was the tradition preserved by some of the Smith descendants, some from some of um, Joseph Smith's sister that was allegedly told by Emma, and that was also told by. Um, preserved by Joseph the third about Emma burning the revelation. And so if Emma really, if they're admitting that there was a revelation and Emma burned it, it raises the big question. Um, which, you know, that's what Brigham Young's claiming in Utah is that the original copy of this revelation was burned by Emma. Um, William Clayton wrote it and she burned it, but Newell K. Whitney got a copy before she, before it was burned. And that's why we have it today. And so if the, RLDS Smith family are preserving a tradition that Emma did indeed burn a revelation, then you really got to ask yourselves, why did, why did she burn this revelation? And why, what, and she admit, she denied it publicly. She said, I had never seen this revelation and Brigham's totally, you know, th this is a total falsehood that I burned it because I've never even seen it. It's what her public testimony was to the reorganization in response to Brigham Young, but privately her family preserved the tradition that she did burn the revelation, which is strong, compelling evidence, in my opinion, that there was indeed a revelation. And so that was the big thing. The other th big thing in the debate was whether William Clayton's journals were, were uh, are reliable, whether he's a reliable source for Joseph's polygamy. And I argue hard that the journals are reliable because they are not redacted to support Utah Mormonism. And the, it details the confusion with the succession crisis over who Joseph's successor is going to be, where initially they're thinking maybe it'll be Samuel, but Emma is interestingly pushing for William Marks to be the successor. And he's not, there's not a, really a word really 
positive about the apostles. He's kind of complaining that William Clayton, no, excuse me, he's complaining about Willard Richards and W.W. W. Phelps being secretive in their discussions about, you know, about after Joseph's death. And he's, he's, he's concerned about that. And he's like, why are they being secretive? And then finally, he says, Newell K. Whitney explains that Emma and William Marks are against the, you know, the certain teachings. And if they take control of the church, then our spiritual blessings will be destroyed. And that's referencing them being against the, you know, plural marriage and all of, you know, the temple ordinances, etc. cetera. And, um, and so, you know, William Clayton's journal, when you read it, it reads like an authentic document, like it's not redacted. It's dealing with the raw conflicts and controversy in 1843 and 1844 in Nauvoo. Um, and the stuff on polygamy includes an entry that's kind of the only contemporary source of Joseph Smith criticizing Brigham Young, where he's, he's allegedly, Joseph says that certain individuals had transgressed and the Lord took their lives for transgression and that Brigham also transgressed, but I prayed for the Lord to spare his life. Um, but William Clayton records Brigham Young denies having transgressed. And so, you know, that's a fascinating entry. You can speculate about it. But it clearly isn't something you were writing if you were writing a journal to bolster Brigham Young, right, and, and Utah Mormonism. And um, that was in the middle of a discussion about plural marriage. And what it seems to be implying is different men going to loose conduct, as in um, taking unauthorized plural wives without Joseph Smith's consent is what that seems to be implying, or some other vague sexual immorality is what that entry in um, June of 1843 seems to be implying. And so those are the two big ones. And then I think we, we just covered ceilings versus polygamy. Um, but the opposite side, their big arguments for their case is they argue, and, and I, I, I applaud them. They did really good in, in presenting their case where they argue really strongly from Hiram Smith's um they're arguing from the public denials of polygamy in Nauvoo against section 132. And he really emphasizes Hiram Smith's April, 1843 conference, excuse me, April, 1844 general conference sermon where Hiram teaches eternal marriage, but really strongly says, speaks out against polygamy. God has not commanded any one of you to have any more wives um, and if any elder tries to tell you that, you I give you license to punch him in the nose. And so Hiram does use some very strong language. And he says, this isn't a carefully worded denial. And I, I agree, that wasn't a carefully worded den denial. Um, you know, it, But Hiram at the same time was teaching eternal polygamy is what they, they don't seem to be recognizing is that Hiram says that Joseph sealed both his living wife and his deceased wife to him. He admits that when he's t announcing the doctrine of eternal marriage at general conference. And then that's also what Joseph m admits in June of 1844 in the um, Nauvoo City Council minutes in response to the expositors. He says, well, they make it a criminality to have more than one wife, uh, you know, to have a, a wife on earth while I have one in heaven, according to the keys of the priesthood. And so there is this doctrine taught of eternal polyg of eternal polygamy, which was even acknowledged in the Times and Seasons in November of 1844, while they were still publicly against earthly polygamy. And it was definitely, uh, I, I think they did really good in arguing their case. What I do think is a big misrepresentation that we didn't get to cover in the debate is the claim that the Brighamites were falsifying documents. And the big, the biggest argument they use for that is the October fifth, eighteen forty three journal entry of Joseph Smith, where it, the the original entry says Joseph forbids a man preaching, teaching, or practicing having more than one wife on this law. Joseph forbids it and the practice thereof. And the expanded entry in the history of the church says adds, for I hold the keys of this power, and there never is but one on the earth on whom these keys are conferred. And uh, the Lord is, and I, and I've always said that the a man should have but one wife unless the Lord directs otherwise. And so there's this fleshed out entry in the history of the church, which is used as a big argument 
of the Brighamites falsifying documents. But the fact that we have the original journal entry shows that they were not editing the original journal. They were not editing original, they were not forging original documents. They left it as it is. And that's why we can look at the Joseph Smith papers and see the original journal and see the drafts of the history of the church. If these guys were in a malicious conspiracy to be falsifying history, they wouldn't be leaving all of these documents. They wouldn't be recording all of their discussions of we're going to, we're not going to include this in the history. We're going to include this in the history. You know, they, they, they kept a lot of records and the history of the church is a very complex work. You know, it's, um, you know, most modern historians don't use it because they say we should use the Joseph Smith papers, um, which is great and all, but um, not everyone has the money to go out and buy a whole set of the Joseph Smith papers. That's a significant financial investment. And the history of the church, in my opinion, does pretty well faithfully represent original documents. Like they were trying to make a faithful history, but at the same time, they were you know, they had their narratives and they, um, you know, wanted to make sure that people weren't getting confused and would, you know, flesh out entries, sometimes leave out entries based off of their biases. Um, but they definitely weren't making it to be a, a document showing that Joseph Smith didn't deny polygamy because there are public denials of Joseph Smith of polygamy in the history of the church. Like the most famous one, what a thing it is for a man to be accused of having seven wives when I can only find one in May of 1844, that is right in the history of the church. They quote the history of the church account of that sermon. So you can't be telling me the history of the church isn't reliable in one regard, but it is reliable, you know, you know, that we can't trust it, the Brighamites at all because of this one editorial change. But when you actually do accept the history of the church, including uh, anti, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not a joke, I'm innocent of polygamy sermon by Joseph Smith as well. So, you know, it's, I think it's a huge misrepresentation to say that that's evidence of forging documents. And the other thing that wasn't mentioned in the debate is that Joseph Smith himself actually was working on the history of the church in his lifetime. He completed it up to 1838. And you can see that Joseph was actually going back and in the early parts of the church history, 1830, 1831, um, 1829, was throwing in some revelations from the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants. Like, And these revelations were um, fleshed out in the Doctrine and Covenants when, uh, you know, rather than including, say, the original smaller revelation, right? And you've done some good historical work on, um, you know, defending you know, that because that's something anti-Mormons like to bring up is that Joseph Smith changed some of his revelations. And, you know, there's stuff in the Bible about, say, you, you've shown that Jeremiah, right, would rewrite his, uh, you know, write similar words is what the Lord commands him. And so, uh, you know, that to me, the editing of the history is not as big of a thing as they would make it out to be. And I do think it's a misrepresentation of the actual historical record to say that they were forging documents based off of that. And then the other big thing, I think Mark Tensmeyer mentioned this, I thought he did a good job mentioning this in response to them, was that the document, was that DNC 132 isn't the only example of, so there are some sources that say there were shorter copies of DNC 132 circulated. And these guys wanted to use that as evidence to say, this could have been a forged Brigham Young document instead. Um, but Mark Tensmeyer pointed out that other revelations of Joseph Smith, there are multiple versions in circulation. And one thing that we didn't really get time to mention that we didn't mention is the fact that um, DNC 132 is the most, the, the revelation in the Doctrine and Covenants, we know the most about its history and being recorded and that we know about the original draft of it written by William Clayton. We know that that draft, when it was copied by, um, so Newell K. Whitney had Joseph C. Kingsbury copy it. And we also know that um, Newell K. K. Whitney had his son, Horace K. Whitney, make a second copy. And so we actually know more about DNC 132's 
um, history than we do of any other revelation because we don't have many original copies of revelations. And I think there's very, very few, if any, I think Mark Tensmeyer told me there aren't any original versions of any of the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants. We only have fine copies that were copied in, say, Revelation Book 1, Revel Curtain Revelation Book 2, the Book of Commandments, you know, the Book of the Law of the Lord, etc. And so we actually know more about the provenance of DNC 132 than we do of any other revelation. And yeah, and then it got into the ceilings versus polygamy debate. And one thing the other side mentioned that I thought was a good point is they say that some people could, because they were teaching this e eternal ceilings where you could be sealed to several women eternally, that is you know, what Hiram announced at the April 1844 conference, that somebody could misinterpret that as being authorizing polygamy on this life. And that's one of their arguments that I think is, you know, a pretty that's a that's a compelling one that you could make. Um, and that could explain William Marx thinking that yes, there was a revelation authorizing polygamy. And that could explain James Whitehead. That wouldn't really explain Ebenezer Robinson. Ebenezer Robinson said Hiram taught him polygamy and told him that you can um you know you can marry a you know find find a find uh you know you can get a a a girl to come live with you, stay with your family. And uh, as a maid and, um, or, or, you know, as, as a health housekeeper and, you know, then we can get, have her sealed to you. And if she were to get pregnant, then we've got a place away from Nauvoo where she could go. And then we could say that she just had an elder, a, a husband as an elder away on a mission is what he explained. Hiram taught him. And so that isn't something that could be fabric. That's not a misunderstanding. And Mark Tensmeyer says it's not plausible that so many people would misunderstand what Joseph Smith taught. And they like to, you know, and, and the, the theory is, is that there could have been this shorter revelation that didn't authorize polygamy and that the Brighamites corrupted this shorter revelation by adding all this polygamy stuff to it in the beginning and the end. Um, but the big question is why didn't Joseph Smith, why, why isn't that revelation preserved anywhere? If that really was, if there really was a different revelation, why didn't Joseph Smith publish it? And why didn't Emma or Joseph the third talk about how there was this different revelation? They should have really, pres there should be a lot more historical evidence for the existence of this other revelation. If, that really was the case. But the reality is they only have to go off of James Whitehead and William Law to really argue. And I think they tried to use Kingsbury, but I don't think that's very compelling to, to ask a guy 50 years later how long it took him to write a document and him not being sure how long it took him exactly, how many hours, you know, um, it, he's not really compelling, but, you know, the original revelation should have been preserved if there really was a anti-polygamy original eternal, you know, an eternal marriage, but anti-polygamy revelation that had been given that was not corrupted by the Brighamites, if that really were the case. And um, you got to, you also have to wrestle with the fact of the story of Emma burning the revelation. And I saw one of the, one of the best guys to really, come up be actually trying to theorize the polygamy denial narrative, like flesh it out is Peter Brown. And he, he's like, well, maybe Emma and Joseph decided to burn the revelation later because it was being misconstrued and misunderstood by people is what he, 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 he that's how he tries to theorize it. But I'm like, is it, that's not what you would do if people are misinterpreting and falsely interpreting revelation, you would publish it and get the real version out there so that everyone could um, have have the actual real, you know, to, to settle the difficulty. But that's the big thing with the June 1844 conflict between the expositor and what happened in the city council minutes published in the Nauvoo neighbor is there in all this discussion, Joseph is having all these things said about them, but they don't actually publish the revelation when they really, if it was what the polygamy denial narrative is, then they really should have published that. And 
ultimately it just um it's it's not really tenable it's like when you actually think of the the logical leaps and bounds we mentioned who killed joseph smith he has to go through some huge leaps and ignore a ton of evidence to argue that the apostles murdered Joseph Smith. It's absolutely ridiculous. And he's ignoring big pieces of evidence that would, that, that show it's completely implausible. Um, but basically Mark Tensmeyer mentioned that that's the big thing that is the problem with um, the, the polygamy dial is that they don't actually flesh out a big competing theory of how polygamy is introduced. Peter Brown is probably the 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 one who's who's done the most to do that, and even his theory doesn't really hold up. Like the the this theory that Joseph Smith was doing adoption ceilings, um, and that those get confused for polygamy, is not very plausible, especially when you realize that there isn't solid evidence of the law of adoption in Nauvoo until Brigham Young and the apostles start teaching it in 1845. Um, it, the seeds of it, I believe, come from Joseph, where Joseph was saying, you know, we need to seal the human family together. We need to um, seal all you can. But there's no evidence that um, he was actually performing adoption sealings in his lifetime. And I guess kind of a, a closing kind of note on to kind of summarize my what I would take away from these debates is don't ever trust someone's word for sources. You need to be continually asking, how do you know that with sources? Because the claim that there were love, that Joseph was sealing men and women to him. So Joseph was having men sealed to him. Where, where, what is your source for that? And these guys don't have a source for that, you know? And so if they don't have a source for that, either you need to be digging and looking for one and you need to be less certain until you find it. Or, you know, you need to drop that talking point. Um, and similarly, there's other parts of the polygamy denial claim that aren't plausible, like saying that Cochranites or, or that aren't don't have any evidence to back them up. There's claims that are repeated that don't have any evidence. The idea that Cochranites were doing sexual foot washings before um, intercourse is something that they mentioned. There is no evidence for that. There's no evidence in any historical document. The Cochranites were doing polygamy and they were doing foot washings, but those were separate practices. They were doing foot washings because that is a New Testament practice that many different restorationists or various Christian groups have engaged in throughout the years. They were doing polygamy, which they called, you know, the, um, you know, spiritual wifery. And that's the only similarity is that they were both calling it spiritual wifery. And so this claim is used to kind of try to argue that the apostles were doing um, these Cochranite stuff in England because they were doing foot washing. So that isn't, um, that isn't compelling when you realize there isn't evidence of the Cochranites doing sexual foot washings. And again, um, you know, you got to always be asking people for their sources. Like I, there's a recent person who talked at, at, at one of these um, gatherings who, who, who was talking on the, who killed Joseph Smith um, narrative. And he was sharing he was making some pretty bold claim. He was attacking, um, he was attacking academic Utah Mormon historians, and he was sounding very similar to the Joseph Smith Foundation, unfortunately, and some of his um, critiques. And he makes some claims in that presentation. He tries to say um, that w one of the sources says that W. W. Phelps was in the room at Carthage with um, Taylor and Richards, and he also says. The Richard says he didn't have a gun, that he just had a cane, but later is guarding Joseph's body with his shotgun. You need to be asking, how do you know that? I want that source. I'm not just trusting someone at their at their word. Like, I don't believe either of those sources actually exist because they sound so outlandish that you would have to, sh you know, actually show me where that comes from. Like, at the very most, that could be a unreliable third party witness that might have added different things or got mistaken about different characters in, involved in the martyrdom. But like I said, you got to be asking more, how do we know this? And being more cautious about making assertive historical claims, unless you have really dug in and read 
you know, you, you've dug into original sources, you've read the, the histories that have been written, and you have interacted with the scholarly community. You really need to be doing all three. And if you really only engage in, say, trying to dig into the original sources by yourself, or say, only reading the historical manuscripts, you know, if you're only if you're not being well balanced and rounded in your in your endeavor to study out a historical topic, you're going to be missing things where as you need to be keeping an open mind and you do need to be, you know, asking and, and not trusting someone just because they have a narrative that you might like. So. No, great. Thanks for that. I greatly appreciate that. Um, so any other comments on this particular topic that you want to add? Um, let's see. I'm sorry. I, I, I just got, you know, kind of was flowing there, but yeah, I thought the debates turned out really well. I, I, I was pretty happy with them. Like I said, we weren't because of time constraints, we weren't able to cover everything. Like they, they made some pretty sweeping attacks. Um, they accused the apostles of doing polygamy in England, which is an interesting theory. There's some interesting evidence regarding that but there's not really actual proof and the, the the big thing they cite that i think is misused is the claim that brigham young said that he got the revelation and he, he got a revelation about polygamy in england and before he came back to the united states and joseph smith taught him it that's that sounds like you know that's that sounds huh you know except for they said the same thing about baptism for the dead Baptism for the dead. Actually, the idea is that that started off in England among the English saints, and then that came to Nauvoo, and Joseph introduced the doctrine after some. But it originally started with a vision of Anne Booth in England of there being preaching to the dead in the spirit world and baptisms for the dead in the spirit world. And Joseph Smith, in response to that, says, um, "It's it's a partially true, but they aren't actually doing baptism in the spirit world." It's something that has to be offered to them on this side, but it, the vision's good because it was teaching her the importance of the necessity of baptism. And so that's what was sparked Joseph Smith on baptism for the dead was this vision in England. Um, and similarly, there was talk of this doctrine of exaltation that God was once a man and that men can become gods, you know, they can become exalted as God is. Um, that's something that Brigham Young said that was he got a revelation on that in England as well. And um, Lorenzo Snow also kind of talks a bit about having certain impressions in England. And this only makes sense if you believe in the, you know, that the church is going to be, God's going to give revelation to different church members. He's not going to, he's, he's not, the whole purpose of Mormonism isn't just for the prophet to receive revelation, but everyone is supposed to have the gift of the Holy Ghost and be getting revelations. And so, Brigham Young would say, God can reveal to you mysteries that he hasn't revealed yet to me, but the priesthood is the channel where it's to be given to the body of the saints generally. And he said that any true revelation of a new principle that God gives to you, he says, it's going to be imparted with a warning. You are not to be sharing this without the authorization of, you know, unless it's been, you know, until the 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 channel of the priesthood is approving these you know this approving it being taught and disseminated you know and that goes back to joseph smith where joseph smith taught about there being order in the channel of revelation for the church so that's one big thing that i i think that that's an interesting point they, they bring up about um in england there was you know people who were you know engaging in fam familiarity with, with the sisters and there may have possibly been ideas of plural marriage in England, but I don't think it was actually something that was practiced. And if it was, there would have been more said about it by um, antagonistic sources. Um, and then the other thing that they bring up that we didn't really respond to because we didn't have time is they really wanted to attack Brigham Young on his doctrines in Utah. If you saw some of the parts in that second debate, there was just a lot of railing against Brigham Young. Brigham Young taught X, Y, Z thing, you know, totally contradict, you know, totally opposite of what Joseph Smith said. And I think that's a, not taking a very nuanced position. That's not a well-studied position because when you actually look at the history of a lot of what Brigham Young taught, a lot of this controversial stuff 
He's just sounding like an Old Testament prophet, in my opinion. Very similar Old Testament ideas. And some of the stuff that they say that Joseph Smith didn't taught, like, so Joseph does make Adam be a significant priesthood figure in some of his later Nauvoo sermons. He, he doesn't equate him with God in those sermons. Um, but, you know, you can see how Brigham Young's Adam God theory could have grown out of Joseph Smith's emphasis on Adam and his revelation on the ancient of days. And similarly, you know, they mentioned like blood atonement. There's blood, Joseph Smith makes statements about the necessity of capital punishment. That's what blood atonement was, was that there are certain criminals who the most grievous of crimes deserve to be have their blood shed. And that's Again, going back to the Old Testament, what's written in Genesis and written in um, Exodus about different crimes. And um, that's something that Joseph Smith also taught in a number of, of statements. There, There's the March 1843 statement where he talked about how if he had to do capital punishment, he would make sure that their blood was spilled on the ground. And so I, I do think that we need you should definitely be cautious and definitely always be open to studying and, and 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 considering different perspectives and not being super dogmatic about a historical position unless you have really studied it, it super well it's kind of my position on that so and i i guess one last little point let me get take a drink real quick On the issue of historical credibility, I think there is a jump where they try to say, we disagree with Brigham Young, Mor Utah, early Utah Mormonism on doctrine, so therefore they are not historically trustworthy. I don't think that, I think that is a complete jump in logic that does not actually make sense. You need to prove them being historically untrustworthy in order to argue for them being historically untrustworthy, not that I don't like what they were teaching. And the big problem with the claims of historical untrustworthiness is that the Brighamites do seem to be, all the evidence indicates that they were historically trustworthy, in my opinion, where if they could, wanted to, they could have just had William Clayton, if they were really into lying and fabricating documents, they should have had just William Clayton rewrite a revelation on um, polygamy. You know, they shouldn't have just... Joseph C. Kingsbury is kind of, he's just a random scribe. He did some work for the Whitney family, uh, for Newell K. Whitney, um, it would have, it, it, the story doesn't really, it's not as polished as you would expect if it was a fabricated document. And similarly, the RLDS, the early RLDS position actually wasn't that Joseph didn't teach polygamy. They tried to say he taught it, but he repented of it shortly before his death was kind of what William Marks tried to say. And Brigham Young, he just says, I don't know. I wasn't there. He says, some say, I, I know that Joseph Brigham said, I know he was worn out with it, but as to denying it, I don't believe he ever denied it, is what Brigham said. And that's the words of an honest man, not someone saying, you know, I I think that's totally garbage, you know, and I, I totally refute William Marks on this. He just says, you know, I don't really have all the information on that. And, you know, he's, he, he admits the limitations of his knowledge on various things, Um and in contrast to the Brighamites where, you know, the, the documents that do exist don't really support a conspiracy narrative, the the RLDS church's documents do have the problems, as I mentioned, where you have pages torn out of diaries, you have people saying one thing privately and the exact opposite thing publicly with James Whitehead and um, John Hawley also privately knew that Joseph had taught polygamy, but publicly says the opposite. And so, you know, I do think that the history is, the history is complex, but I don't think that there is, you know, it's, it's complex in the, in the way that we, there are certain things that are, you know, beyond the realm of possibility, probability, I would say. And Joseph Smith being not practicing polygamy is beyond the, realm of probability in my opinion so do you have any other thoughts or any, any other questions you want to uh no i think that kind of goes through um the two debates and its background historically in modern times as well pretty well so um um for those who want to delve more into this particular topic i will include your journal article um in your publication one eternal round 
Uh, also include uh, something by Brian Hales as well as his uh, uh, website, Mormon Polygamy Documents, for those who want to delve more. And also the B.H. Roberts Foundation and Mormon are have a few Q&As and Q&A ORs, i.e. research um, pages as well on Joseph Smith's polygamy, as well as Fanny Alger, the very first uh, wife of uh, Joseph Smith. Um, but also, if you were to send me the link to the new YouTube page, I'll include that in the uh, show notes as well. Um, yep, I will do that. So uh, any other final comments or uh, you want to address or do you think uh, we're good to wrap up? I, I, I think that about covers it. I've, I yeah. feel like I, we, we jumped around quite a bit, but I do think that that kind of did summarize it, hopefully, and, you know, provided some additional thoughts on, on the debate. So, yeah, well, that's good. Um, again, really do appreciate your time. Um, so hopefully we can actually have you on again in the near future, maybe to discuss maybe fundamentalism or some other related topic as well. I think that would be interesting. Uh, and maybe also Adam God with a certain public, uh, certain thing is published hopefully this year as well. Uh, we can discuss <laughs> that as well. So um, yeah, uh, again, Jacob, really do appreciate uh, your work uh, and also the two debates. I'll link them in the show notes as well for people to pursue as well. So um, thanks and uh, really appreciate your time. Well, thanks for having me. It's My always pleasure. a great pleasure to talk with you. Yeah, same.